Welcome to this webinar of the Monocle project. This is the third webinar we are presenting. The first two you can see on the top of this slide. They were, uh, the first one was on uh, um, the sort of technology that we are trying to develop within the project and what uh, challenges and opportunities we currently see for water quality monitoring in general. Uh, our second webinar took place in June and there we uh, explored the, um, the range of micro scale to macro scale uh, citizen science to satellite observations, uh, again focusing on potential challenges and, uh, and opportunities supported by technology among other means. And today we want to look a little bit closer into the sustainable sustainability of building an environmental monitoring network specifically for water quality. Uh, because why would we develop anything if it's not going to be sustainably used? Uh, and for that, um, we have uh, invited some uh, contributions from ongoing activities, which I'll um, uh, go through in a minute. I just want to say that um, um, this webinar and everyone's contributions um, is going to be is being recorded and will be available through the Monocle website, where you can also find the earlier recordings. So when we refer back to anything from the first two webinars, um, you know where to find more information. So we uh, have today contributions from uh, James Water, um, that is um, David Chapman on my left, uh, from the European Environment Agency, Henrik Anderson, and um, Geo Aquawatch, Mary Beth Neal is on the, on the phone with us. And um, they will be um, showing us uh, a little bit what's ongoing in either the community or the European framework of um, Copernicus services and uh, James Water, the global um, uh, water ambient water quality monitoring. Um, so this is us. We also have a number of people from the Monocle project, various organizations around the table. Um, I'll start from, uh, from the far side. Kati Bozo works at Water Insight and is in Monocle, our uh, lead on Work Package 5, which focuses on data and interoperability. Um, next to Katrin is um, Oli Clements. He works at PML and is um, implementing um, uh, data services technology experts on this. Um, we have off camera, which you'll, uh, you, you can hear her shout when things go wrong. Uh, Jess Hurd, she's our uh, project manager and communications lead. And uh, she's actually assisted by someone not on the, on, the, on the list here, Adam Varley from University of Stirling. Welcome as well. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, we'll, we'll, we will have the opportunity to give a little bit of background um, about ourselves um, when we get to your part. So, when we started thinking about the uh, sustainability of environmental monitoring networks, um, uh, we thought, okay, we need to scope this because uh, sustainability is a rather large issue to tackle. Um, so, if there's one thing that you would take home from this webinar, or if you need to leave soon to pick up the kids, but then uh, it is that to sustainably monitor the environment, we need also the monitoring networks to be sustainable. Um, it may seem obvious, but what it comes down to is a number of criteria. First of all, that the, um, uh, having an, uh, a sustainable monitoring network needs to help us uh, use resources uh, efficiently. It's also to <coughs> use the resources needed for setting up monitoring efficiently. Um, ideally, it uh, increases cost efficiency or economic growth, or um, it helps build better resilience to episodic events, for example. So then it becomes very useful. Um, it should not be a top-down effort. It should be a distributed effort. Everybody needs to do their part. So for that, you need um, a significant amount of transparency in where data are going to be used, what they ultimately are going to be used for, for example, but also um, to share the knowledge needed to interpret data that are being generated globally. And uh, last but not least, uh, data obviously should be sufficiently reliable to, um, to be uh, fit for purpose, whether that be an environmental monitoring context or maybe legal context. Then you can identify a number of building blocks, which I will not uh, read out all, but um, uh, the most important is perhaps that we need to really embrace all the, uh, the arsenal of methods currently available, including the satellite observations, the in situ observations, the latest technologies, the time tested technologies, etc. And we have already identified a number of challenges when it comes to that, and that is for for one, it's that in situ and satellite observation don't always focus on the same variables. 
Um, so there's a potential mismatch there, which makes integration difficult. And also they're often um, implemented by diff different stakeholders from government to research institutions to individuals, uh, citizen scientists perhaps. And you can ask yourself in questions such as, well, who should pay for this? Uh, who may benefit from this? Uh, and who should act on the information? And we did ask some of those questions in the uh, water quality survey that we launched earlier this year as part of the Monocle project. Um, the survey results should be on our website shortly. Um, we're just uh, finalizing the document uh, and you will be able to find that on our website under resources. So all graphs like this from the survey um, will be there with some um, annotation. Uh, one question we ask who is ultimately responsible or is most responsible for environmental monitoring of, of water quality. And uh, the, the, the trend in this, uh, in this set of answers was that it's mostly government uh, from the local to the national to intergovernmental institutions who should take uh, charge when it comes to setting up water quality monitoring. Um, and for example, uh, there was less it was considered that space agencies have much less responsibility there, even though they are currently active in this field. Um, citizens might be very willing, but they don't carry the responsibility. So then we can ask the follow-up question, which I'll ask to um, Debbie Chapman of um, uh, representing GEMS Water, and that is how well are we currently equipped to do this? And um, um, should we despair or should we be hopeful? So I'll give you the, the remote. Thank you very much. Looking forward to your... Um, contribution. Well, hello everybody. I'm uh, Deborah Chapman, or Debbie as most people know me. Um, I'm from the UN Environment GEMS Water Capacity Development Centre in Cork, Ireland, um, and we're part of the uh, global GEMS Water programme. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about us and our interaction with the new Sustainable Development Goal for Water. Can't really talk about sustainability these days without the topic of the sustainable development goals coming up. And uh, you may or may not be aware that in, in September 2015, the United Nations General Assembly approved Agenda 2030 for sustainable development, which has a lot of goals that countries should try and meet by 2030. And one of those goals relates to water. And the water goal was very new. There wasn't anything like it in the Millennium Development Goals. So it's, it's something we all have to kind of get used to the idea and then start working towards. So goal six says ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. Well, in order to have a goal, you also need targets. And within goal six, there are six targets um, and uh, each of those targets has to be in some way um, monitored through the use of uh, indicators. The target that we're particularly interested here um, and GEMS Water as well is target 6.3 which links pollution, wastewater and water quality. It's um, wording is quite long and it says by 2030 improve water quality by reducing pollution, eliminating dumping and minimizing release of hazardous chemicals and materials, halving the proportion of untreated wastewater, and substantially increasing recycling and safe reuse globally. Now, in order to know whether you're achieving that target by 2030, there has to be a way of measuring it. And so for target 6.3, two indicators uh, were decided upon. Uh, indicator 631, which is to do with um, water pollution, uh, wastewater discharges in particular, and 632, which is to do with the water quality part of uh, the target. Each uh, target has been assigned uh, a UN uh, custodian agency, and within um, goal six, target 6.3 is shared between World Health Organization primarily and United Nations Environment Program. And indicator 6.3.2 uh, has been particularly designated to the UN environment. And the GEMS Water Program, of which we're part, the Global Environment Monitoring System for Fresh Water, is uh, a program of the United Nations Environment. It's been around a long time. It's been encouraging freshwater quality monitoring and data sharing on freshwater quality from in situ measurements 
since 1978. We don't do the monitoring ourselves. We encourage countries to do the monitoring for their own purposes, but also to be willing to share the data with the idea that it will encourage better water quality management um, and assist uh, with the generation of global and regional national water quality assessments. So when uh, Agenda 2030 was signed and Indicator 632 um, was part of that uh, suite of various indicators, huge number of indicators, I can't remember the exact number, it was quite logical that GEMS Water would be involved in this one because uh, Indicator 632 is the proportion of bodies of water with good ambient water quality and in order to know whether you've got good ambient water quality, you need to monitor that water quality. So GEMS Water is implementing this uh, indicator on behalf of UN Environment. Uh, that has involved over the last couple of years, uh, developing a methodology for the indicator, uh, trialing it, um, and then rolling it out to a baseline data drive in 2017 gathering that data, assessing that data, and producing the first indicator report, which came out in August this year. And what we're now currently doing is looking closely at the revision of the methodology, taking into consideration the feedback from the first uh, data drive, and also gathering information from other experts as well. The next data drive um, is due in 2021. So we need to get the method sorted pretty quickly so that countries know what they're trying to do between now and then. But just to kind of give you a quick, very quick skim over the method for indicator 632, if you try and determine what good ambient water quality is, most people will think about the ecosystem uh, and particularly the ecosystem function. Uh, but also many, in many areas, water quality, ambient water quality, untreated, is also used for a number of uh, human activities, including drinking, recreation, etc. So by definition for indicator 632, good ambient water quality should not damage ecosystem function or present a risk to human health. Now, if you're going to decide by using some kind of monitoring system whether you've got good ambient water quality or not, and this has to be done around the world by 190 or so countries, the approach must be globally comparable, but it also has to be uh, accessible for countries of all different economic uh, development levels, which is quite a, damage, uh, quite a challenge when it comes to uh, monitoring water quality. So as with most of the indicators in Goal six, um, the approach has been to take a sort of a progressive monitoring where you have a base level and then you can increase and make it more complex from there. So for indicator 632, level one should be where virtually all countries could report um, the, an indicator value. So for the first baseline data drive, uh, this involved just very simple uh, physico-chemical water quality parameters combined into a water quality index. On the more aspirational level, uh, level two, then there could be more uh, parameters added if the country does that, and also maybe greater complexity, different types of monitoring, different approaches such as uh, biological, microbiological, or earth observation. But the base level, which is globally comparable and accessible for everybody, would be level one. In order to actually report the indicator value, a country needs certain things. Uh, it needs to have its water bodies, rivers, lakes, and groundwaters delineated so that they're defined. Um, then a monitoring program needs to exist in those water bodies. And for part of that monitoring program, certain parameters need to be measured from uh, groups of typical physical chemical parameters, which uh, have a, a basically a good scientific rationale behind them. But also you need to have some target levels or target values for those parameters, which the country itself decides represents what for them is good water quality. So it could be um, a target value for uh, say phosphorus level over the whole country for every water body, or it might be target values for lakes versus rivers, or it might be target values for individual water bodies if the country has uh, a lot of um, spatial variability in the water bodies. 
having conducted the, the monitoring, gathered the data, and then you compare it with the target values, the decision was taken that 80% compliance with target values was a, a good way of assessing good water quality. We aren't asking for poor or medium or anything like that, just good or not good, and 80% was the, the threshold value. So every water body is assessed as to whether it's good or not, depending on whether 80% of the measurements meet the target values. And then the national indicator is reported as the percentage of the total number of water bodies that were assessed that met the criteria for good water quality. That is the 80% compliance. So actually what's reported to the UN statistical system is a single percentage value for a country. But uh, we do ask countries to provide some of the metadata behind that as well. The baseline data drive told us a couple of things. Um, out of 190 or so countries, only 52 reported or attempted to report an indicator value. There are a number of reasons for that. Some countries simply said we didn't have time to get organized for this and, and couldn't do it within the time frame. The first baseline data drive did come up rather quickly, so um, we can understand that. Some countries didn't feel they understood what they were supposed to do, and therefore didn't do it. Um, and other countries felt that it wasn't really necessary for them to do it for a whole variety of reasons, such as, you know, we report elsewhere or this isn't, uh, this, this indicator is still at a trial uh, uh, level, so we don't need to, to report it. The other thing that became obvious from the data was that some countries reported using only a few monitoring stations. Well, when you're trying to report a percentage value, that's not particularly representative. Um, and also, if you're only using a few monitoring values, that's probably not representative either, especially when you might have seasonal variations in water quality. So the graph on the left is trying to summarize the data that we did receive. So the color of the circle is, is actually the proportion of water bodies with good ambient water quality. So that's actually the indicator value that was reported with the green colors being 100% down towards the red being 0%. The size of the circle represents the percentage of the country included in the monitoring. So quite a lot of countries felt that they had represented a large part of their country and the number of water bodies that they'd reported but some obviously didn't and only used a very small number of water bodies. The position of the circle along the axis tells you the number of monitoring stations and monitoring values that were used. And again, a huge variety, um, but some, some reporting with just a few values or a few monitoring stations. And that obviously really is unlikely to be representative of the national status. What also became apparent was that the countries with the higher GDP used a far greater number of monitoring stations. That's not surprising, I suppose, because they have the resources to support those monitoring stations. But also what surprised us a little bit was that several of the higher GDP countries only used data from a selection of their stations in their monitoring network. Those are the ones with a little yellow circle around them. Um, and we don't really know the reason for that. Um, but it may be that they have the, the data collected on a national scale for selected stations only, whereas they do in fact have more monitoring stations than that available. Toby, to what extent, I'm paraphrasing on a question from one of the audience from Emmanuel at uh, Tafiri. Um, to what extent do you think this reflects commitment to, first of all, the reporting <laughs> and second of all, actually achieving the SDG? So there's a, there's a difference between those. Um, from the country we've, we've engaged with a lot of countries um, and I think there's a bit of it, it comes up a bit in my next slide there's a bit of a difference between the commitment of the people on the ground who are involved with monitoring water quality who see the benefit in terms of being able to drive them into developing water quality monitoring networks where they may not have them before um, <coughs> there was some lack of political commitment because of under, just simply not understanding what was required, um, but also because they don't have the resources to put towards the reporting and uh, maybe put priority elsewhere. Um, human health, for example, would be perhaps one of the things that often takes a higher priority. And this was something that we observed in, in engaging with countries. Um, so it was a, a whole variety of reasons, really. And, and that's on the next slide. Um, we found that 
in many countries, and we observe this anyway through our work through GEMS Water, not just when the SDGs came along, because we were doing this kind of supporting countries with capacity development and, and encouraging the sharing of data even before SDG Indicator 632, and we've been doing it for the last 40 years. One of the problems in some areas is a lack of technical and institutional capacity to monitor water quality with in situ measurements. Um, and even if the monitoring is, is done, there's often a, a lack of ability and resources to manage the data in such a way that you could easily gather the data for the whole country into one place. So there's, there's difficulties there. And, and also, uh, a lack of understanding about reporting and data analysis. So you end up with large data gaps and, and we have this in the GEMS water database, large data gaps. And this is what's happened here with the SDG indicator too. Another thing that came up and this is what I was alluding to, it's, it's very obvious that there's a lack of knowledge and appreciation amongst many policymakers around the world that ambient water quality is important. Um, so they don't see the, the importance of monitoring it or managing it because they don't necessarily make the direct link between ambient water quality and human health or the other ecosystem services that you get from fresh water. Um, so as a result of that, there's a, a lack of need for in situ water quality data collection at the national scale, at, at the policy and the higher levels, rather than the people who work on the ground who know how, who know how important it is. The other issue that came up um, and related to the number of countries that reported or not, um, was that there are some existing monitoring and reporting frameworks in place, like the Water Framework Directive and the AMCAL reporting system for Africa. And many countries said, well, we're already reporting to whoever it is, the Water, Water Framework Directive. Why do we need to do this as well? And, sim and because the Framework Directive we're reporting to already, is not the same as this one, it's extra work and we don't want to do that. So there, there's a problem there for us and a challenge for actually trying to align these reporting frameworks over the next few years to reduce the burden on countries. When it comes to the methodology, uh, the biggest issues that we came across uh, and have been brought to us were the fact that many countries don't have target values for sim single parameters um, or even for an index of their own. They're, they would have something like standards for drinking water quality, but not for ambient water quality. So many countries didn't simply know what to do with a target value. They had no idea how do we have target values for something like ambient water quality. So there's quite a lot of capacity development to be done in, in that respect. The parameters that were requested to be measured, most countries said they're fine, we can do all that, it's not a problem, um, but we don't necessarily measure them all for quite valid reasons. So um, we, do, we do say to countries, well, you can report what you do measure. Um, you just have to give us the metadata behind that. So if you report five parameters for one water body and only four for another, we, we need to know that because it unbalances the calculation. The other thing that's been raised a lot is, is there the possibility of using alternative monitoring approaches to make this job of reporting indicator 632 easier for us? Um, and ca how can we do that? Can we combine other data sources such as remote sensing, um, in situ sensors, citizen science, modeling, etc.? Can we combine those uh, and use them instead or as well as? And that's where the level two comes in. But we still have uh, quite a lot of work to go to, towards being able to do this. So the next data drive is in 2021. And we have to try and address some of these uh, challenges before then. But I think. Uh, Works ongoing. <laughs> Thank you. It is. Thank you very much, uh, Debbie. I think this is uh, it's, it's quite a good moment to uh, continue towards the contribution from Henrik Anderson of the um, European Environment Agency representing Copernicus in situ. Because actually, what you're saying is that there's, you're saying very clearly there's a multifaceted challenge. On the one hand, limited, uh, limited uh, resources to provide collect data in the first place, but also uh, maybe a, a political. Uh, barrier to um, to invest uh, the effort, but even in countries with high GDP, uh, the effort may be limited because we have already got so many yes. regulations in place. Exactly. Now, if there's anybody better equipped to, there's nobody better equipped to help us out in this minefield of European reg regulations than uh, than Henrik. 
Um, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> um, I should say both uh, Henrik and, uh, and Debbie, as well as some people who are currently in the audience, are on the Monocle Advisory Board. Um, so um, um, your uh, role in guiding us through this minefield is an end, start and end today, of course. Um, so that's it, Henrik. Please um, show us what you um, uh, can share on the coordination of institute activities in Europe. Thanks, uh, Stefan, and um, and good afternoon to all of you. Uh, yes, my name is Henrik Stein Andersen. I'm working with the European Environment Agency, uh, where I'm responsible for coordination of what we can call in situ data related activities in Copernicus. Um, it's, it's a task uh, that has been delegated to us by the European Commission. Uh, I should say that the European Environment Agency is also responsible for, for implementing part of the Copernicus Land Monitoring Service. So uh, Copernicus, most of you uh, will know uh, Copernicus. Copernicus is a, um, uh, a uh, environment monitoring program uh, funded and managed by, by the European Union. It's a huge, uh, huge program. Uh, it covers a number of application areas, produces a lot of data, produces a lot of products. It's been, uh, it's been developing over the last 20 years or so. So now what we are talking about here is really a mature and operational, operational program. It is based on three pillars in a way. It's, uh, there's the space component, which is really huge uh, and consumes a very large part of the budget. Uh, we have the services and we have the in-situ component. So this talk is, is mostly about the in-situ component and it's also about the challenges we face uh, because uh, we need to get access to, to, to in-situ data. So um, before I move on, let me just state one thing that, I mean, in situ data is really essential uh, to Copernicus. Copernicus is not able to produce the products required by the end user without access to in situ data. Also, I would like to underline that actually already now, uh, Copernicus is collecting, analyzing, and using a lot of in situ data. So it's not that we do not have access to any in situ data, of course, but we, we, we would like to get access to more. And I, I'm going to explain a little bit about the challenges that we face. So just to focus a little bit on the in situ component. So what is really the purpose? The purpose is that it should provide reliable and sustainable access to in situ data, relying on existing capacities. And, and this general principle about, uh, about relying on existing capacities, capacities is really important. I mean, Copernicus is not supposed to set up an in situ data infrastructure on a, of its own. It's really, it, it would like to depend on what's available already. It makes sense in a way because, I mean, member states, data providers, and so on and so forth, they actually get something back. They get access to the products, they get access to the space data. So, so it's not a one way street. Uh, so, in fact, uh, the basic idea is that. When we talk about in situ data, uh, Copernicus will rely on existing capacities operated by, by, by at national level, European level, or global level. Uh, the, uh, the in situ component is implemented by the services. They do most of the work because they need access to these data to produce and validate the products. And it's also implemented by the European Environment Agency, and we step in whenever there is some kind of a coordination activity needed. Uh, if if uh, data are required by more than, than one service and it could be um, cost efficient for us to implement the solution and so on and so forth. But most of the work is actually being done by the services. So just to uh, focus a little bit on, on, on the service component, as you know, there are six services. Uh, here we have an example from the Global Land Monitoring Service. Uh, we are talking about fresh water products, water bodies, lake surface water temperature and lake water quality. All these products are in production right now. They are being validated. Uh, you could say that they are now in a, some, some kind of a ramp up phase. So we, ex we expect them to, to mature and to be available uh, in, a, in an operational manner in, 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 in the future. Also, as you know, one of the more mature services, the Marine Environment Monitoring Service, is delivering an, a number of products. Uh, the uh, Marine Environment Service, of course, is a special case because most of the water column actually cannot be monitored from space. 
but but so so we have here a clear example of the importance of of being able to combine in situ data monitoring and space data. So uh, when we know about when we talk about the challenges, of course we have been we have been talking. I mean the EEA. Um, uh, we have been talking to the services. We have asked them, okay, now what kind of challenges do you see? So whenever we ask, they say, okay, sustainability is really a key issue. And why? The reason is that Copernicus is supposed to be operational, and it is operational. And of course, uh, it's also true that in many cases, many of the services will rely still, and they still rely on access to data from research infrastructure, for example. Data being delivered um, and funded by, by true research programs. Uh, so, of course, I mean, you could say that if you cannot expect a certain observing network to deliver data after two or three years, then you would, be, you would get into trouble. So, of course, uh, from an operational point of view, you would need to find a way to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to find a sustained form of funding for these uh, important networks. So, sustainability is really a key challenge. Um, and, and we are trying to, to find different solutions to, to that problem. Data, data policy is another one. I mean, because you can easily imagine the conflict between the very open data policy of Copernicus. I mean, everything, everything is available uh, in an open way. And of course, if you want to combine uh, these products and integrate in situ data into these products, you would also need these data to be delivered under the same open data policy. And, and this is not always the case. So in some cases, we would simply need to work with the data providers and say, okay, um, either you can simply decide to deliver these data and we will only use them for, for internally, or we can find a way to make these data available in, in the open because it makes sense. Uh, this, this, is, uh, this is also something that we, we, we try to solve, try to work directly with, with the data providers and the data provider networks. Accessibility uh, is, is really could also be an issue because, as you know, uh, these services will rely on data from many sources, many, many networks. And of course, um, uh, it will take time for them to, to adapt to a certain delivery mechanism, to a certain format, to a certain um, method or algorithm. And, and of course, some kind of a harmonization across these different data providers would be, would be helpful. And that's also something we, we look at. Uh, coverage, of course, I mean, in certain areas of the world, we do not have, we simply do not have enough data. Could be the Arctic, could be Africa. Uh, we can also, uh, uh, this question about timeliness, again, being an operational service, delivering near real-time products all the time, 24-7, uh, uh, these data needs to be available uh, with a certain timeliness. Many of these uh, challenges, of course, are being, uh, being uh, looked at by Copernicus, by the services, by the EEA, by the Commission, um, and, and we try to find uh, solutions within the Copernicus program. But in many cases, also, actually, we rely on uh, other EU initiatives, for example, like eModeNet, and also like, for example, research uh, programs like Horizon 2020, because some of these will require development, will require research to solve. And, and of course, there is a strong link between Copernicus and Horizon 2020. So in fact, when we identify issues, gaps, challenges, we could go and say to Rise in 2020, okay, could you maybe set up a call that will address these issues? And, and we can then also maybe find, uh, find solutions. Monaco would, 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 be, would be one of these products and uh, projects, but there are many other projects looking at different aspects of, 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 the, of, uh, of Copernicus, both from a uh, service ev uh, evolution point of, of, of perspective, but also when we talk about in situ data. So also just as an example, um, uh, Copernicus is constantly trying to, to, to find ways to evolve the product portfolio. And we ask uh, end users what kind of products would they like to see. So this is, this is an example, just an example, um, uh, focusing on inla in, inland water products. Um, I'm not going to go into detail. I'm just saying that 
when we do this, I think it's extremely important also in the future to not only try to, to understand the, the, uh, the uh, requirements of the end user, but also try to see from an in situ point of view, what would be the implications? What kind of data would be needed to, to, uh, to improve, to evolve uh, the, the, um, the fresh water data uh, product portfolio, for example? And so, so, so not only so we should not only try to to um, to to define the product, to find out do we have access to the space data and all that, but at the same time we should try to look at the in situ side and try to define this upfront, so that the end user can see the importance of uh, of the contributions from his country. Um, I can also say that the EA, uh, when we have been asked to do this uh, uh, coordination of uh, in situ data activities. We've been asked not only to try to, 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 to work across the six services covering all kinds of in situ data, we have also been asked to provide an overview of what's going on inside this in situ component. So we try to, uh, to, uh, to collect and analyze information we get from the services with respect to what kind of data they, they, they require, uh, what data they use and all that. So we, so we try to to, uh, to, uh, to, to create some kind of a picture of what's going on inside the, um, the in situ component. We also do a lot of reports, and I, you have two examples here. We have one report on research infrastructures and Copernicus, because we know that the, uh, the research infrastructures, that they provide a lot of very, very essential data to a number of services. So we wanted to, to, to document uh, the importance of these research infrastructures. So we have done that in that report. It's available from our website. And also uh, the question about sustainability. It is really a, a key question. And you could always talk about funding, uh, but there could be also other possibilities. What we would like to do right now is to document uh, the level of sustainability when we talk about key networks. And, and that's actually what we try to do. This is really ongoing work. Again, this report will be available through our website. But it's just to explain that the, the kind of work that we try to do at the European environment um, is really based on requirements we get from the services. So whenever they say, okay, data policy is an issue, uh, uh, then we try to work with the networks to, to improve this issue, to try to find a way to, um, to, uh, to uh, arrange or to set up uh, partnership agreements, for example, allowing the services to get access to more data. Uh, but also when we talk about uh, uh, sustainability, we try to document the, uh, the situation and, and, and hopefully we, together with the services, then can find a, uh, solutions for the future. Um, if you are very interested in, in this and if you think that you can actually do a, a good work and make more data available in the future to Copernicus or in situ data, then you have this chance actually to, to, to do this work and, 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 and getting uh, some funding from Horizon 2020. This is a new call. It, 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 it was launched uh, a few uh, weeks ago, a week ago or something like that. So, so and you have until March next year to, uh, to send in a, 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 a proposal. So it's really about completing, uh, to, to complete a comprehensive overview of the status of research infrastructures. Now you have it, you, you have it again, research infrastructures. It's not by coincidence it's there. It's because we have raised this issue again and again. So, um, so you will have this opportunity to, to, to complete a compre comprehensive overview of the status of research infrastructures already used by Copernicus and to enable them better to respond to Copernicus operational needs, identify missed in situ observations required to improve the accuracy of the satellite Copernicus products, and also reinforce the cooperation among different Copernicus actors in trusted entities, space data providers, in situ data providers, and research infrastructures. And of course, I mean, this is something I hope uh, that we can do together. I mean, the EA, we have already done part of this work, but it would be really interesting and, and useful to get some help from outside. So I, I and we look very forward uh, to, to, to see this um, uh, project uh, starting uh, probably next year. <coughs> And just to, uh, to, to, to end my presentation, um, uh, when you talk to end users and, 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 and if you ask them, so what is really required for you 
to to um, to invest in using uh, Copernicus products. Then they say, okay, if I'm going to change the way I produce certain products or the, the, the way I'm going to be reporting in the future, I would like a service that is actually uh, sustainable, that is uh, continued into the future. And actually Copernicus is such a service, I mean, or program. I mean, we, we, we can, of course, not go beyond the what we call multi-financial frameworks, seven years budget. Uh, but but uh, but it seems like uh, we can actually expect Copernicus to continue well beyond uh, 2030 or something like that. So this is just to, to, to underline that actually right now member states are discussing how to continue Copernicus and they are discussing the proposal made by the Commission and the idea is now to allocate something a little below 6 billion euros for Copernicus for the next seven years. So at least until 2027, we will have something like Copernicus. We will have open and freely access to products and data and uh, probably also beyond that date. So I think, think that's uh, what I would yeah. like to say. Uh, do you think, Anik, that uh, some of the new funding stream will also be dedicated to improving the institute observation network as a service, as a... Well, it's, it's difficult to say. I mean, in, in fact, I mean, we are not, as an agency, directly involved in the discussions, discussions going on right now. So it's really up to the member states. So if member states, they say, yes, we would like this to be a more visible part of the budget, then I think then, then right. it's really possible. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, of course, what we do right now is <coughs> to have budgets allocated within the different services and the, and the space component. But it, um, that, that is uh, uh, earmarked for, for, for in situ data right. activities in a way. So we have some flexibility, but you're right, there is, there is uh, no, uh, I mean, the in, in situ part is not that visible when we talk about the right. budget, that's correct. But we have some flexibility within the services and the space component. And I think we think it can only improve. Um, yeah, but I mean, also, as if, if I may, I mean, it, it's clear that 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 even though we do not have a, 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 a huge part of the budget allocated for in situ data activities, services are doing a lot. Uh, also, the space component is a human set; uh, they are both doing a lot. Uh, so, so it's it's not that nothing is has, has been done. So streamlining the activity is partly your job, partly the existing services job. Um, but we also have the uh, the intergovernmental initiative that is uh, that is GEO, the Group of Earth Observations. And uh, GEO has a number of working groups, one of which focuses on um, on um, on water, inland and, and coastal water. So we have a representative from um, from Aquawatch uh, with us. Mary Beth, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Yes, we hear you loud and clear. Um, so if Perfect. you talk us through your um, perspective, um, uh, we'll, we'll take it from there again. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Stefan. I'm very pleased to be representing Geo Aqua Watch today uh, on behalf of Steve Greb uh, from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who is unfortunately under the weather uh, today and was uh, unable to give the presentation um, that I am offering, uh, but we certainly wish him well and a speedy recovery. Uh, again, my name is Mary Beth Neely. I am an affiliate of the U.S.'s National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. Uh, and although both Steve and I are, are U.S.-based, uh, AquaWatch has a global representation and is focused on water quality information. AquaWatch can help sustain environmental observation and monitoring by bringing together the water quality community and we can also help stitch together all the great projects and the products we have seen here today, as well as a multitude of others, and leverage those for coordinated and sustained Earth observations that is actually used by managers and decision makers. Uh, we can advocate for the funding and accessibility of water quality data. So as you see on the slide, GEO stands for uh, the Group on Earth Observations. It is an intergovernmental organization working to improve availability, accessibility, and use of a variety of Earth observations for societal benefit. Within the GEO context, 
Earth observations means both remote sensed data and in situ data. As I mentioned, AquaWatch focuses on the water quality uh, data. GEO is a partnership between 105 member countries and 118 participating organizations. It's headquartered in Geneva. GEO envisions a future where decisions and actions that benefit humankind are informed by coordinated, comprehensive, and sustained Earth observations. Again, they're also seeking full and open access to data to, to, data to benefit both developed and developing countries. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, a central part of GEO's mission, and one that GEO Aqua Watch Initiative directly supports, is the GEOS, which stands for Global Earth Observation System of Systems. GEOS is a set of coordinated, independent, and open Earth observation collection, information, and processing systems. GEOS links observing systems together to strengthen monitoring of the state of our planet, ensuring data is accessible and interoperable among those systems. GEOS is important because it furthers our understanding of Earth processes and enhances predictive capabilities that enable decision making. Next slide, please. Uh, AquaWatch recently achieved initiative status within GEO. Uh, and agreed to further its mission. Uh, but within that larger picture of GEO, AquaWatch has its own mission, which is to improve the coordination, delivery, and utilization of water quality information for the benefit of society. AquaWatch's goal is to develop and build global capacity and the utility of Earth observation-derived water quality data, products, and information to support water resources management and sound decision, decision making by managers. We want to get people using all of these great data products from the projects and providing validation data for new areas to improve them even more, and especially in developing countries and in data poor areas. Next slide, please. AquaWatch is a community of practice for water quality. It's made up of various people interested in water quality. We most recently came together in August 2018 at the University of Stirling in the United Kingdom. Uh, the folks assembled represented province, state, federal, and international governmental agencies, private industry, nonprofit organizations, NGOs, and academic institutions. Our workshop was held jointly with the final Global Lakes meeting, and the theme of our workshop this year was to identify knowledge gaps, challenges, and opportunities that have arisen from all of these projects. This would give AquaWatch a good starting point to begin erasing those problems and take advantage of any opportunities that were identified. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Sorry. AquaWatch. Thank you. AquaWatch has created uh, five working groups. Those are shown across the top of that slide. Uh, and the, they more or less align with our five objectives as well. The first working group covers outreach and user engagement in supporting of facilitating, facilitating effective partnerships between producers, providers, and users of water quality data, data products, and information. The second working group covering observation and data supports objective two to improve the analysis and integration of in situ and remote sensing water quality data. The third working group covering products and information supports the projects discussed here, as well as many others that develop and deliver fit for purpose water quality products and information services. Working group four, the distribution access and visualization working group supports objective fours, technology transfer, and open global access to water quality data products and information. Working group five for education and capacity building supports objective five, advocating for better education and capacity, both globally and locally, for use of water quality information for making decisions. All of these working groups do have a lot of interaction and the tasks they have undertaken, both now and in the, uh, in the past, uh, support many objectives, not just the one they are most closely aligned with in their working group's identity. We are seeking participants on working groups 
and to work on recently identified tasks that cross cut several of these working groups. Our contact information will be available at the end of the presentation and please feel free to reach out to me with any questions or to volunteer. And the last slide, please. <clears throat> As I mentioned, we recently convened a workshop at the University of Sterling uh, to set a work plan for 2018 to 19. And a workshop goal was to identify knowledge gaps, identify challenges and opportunities so that AquaWatch could begin tackling those in the coming 12 to 18 months. AquaWatch is currently all volunteer, although Steve and I are partially funded at 25% time for the next six months to support the initiative. However, we are seeking funding and any ideas would be appreciated. I've also already written down the uh, previous um, um, grant RFP that was um, offered up uh, about Copernicus, so we appreciate hearing about that. So during our workshop, we broke out into two uh, working groups. Essentially, we combined the user engagement and the outreach and capacity building groups into one team and the data-centric working groups into another team. Uh, the, these two um, breakouts are shown in the major um, bolded headings there. Uh, they're shown on the slide and each team identified five to six tasks that can be accomplished within the next six to 12 months in an effort to sustain environmental observation monitoring and engage the broader water quality community of practice. The general consensus was that effort was needed on data validation and ensuring reliability in the user community and gathering available sources of data and data products and sharing those with a larger and more engaged user community while underscoring their fit for purpose. And that concludes my presentation. Uh, if any of you are interested in working on any of these tasks, as I mentioned, go ahead and reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary Beth, and uh, give our best to Steve as well uh, when, he, when he makes it back into the office. Um, so we, we've seen actually that uh, there's a lot of overlap between the, the main points of, the, of these three contributions uh, and our expectations as well, um, that uh, the community needs to come together, there needs to be uh, an increase uh, or a good balance between um, uh, providing useful data, providing useful uh, analysis tools, providing training and capacity building. And we also see uh, from the last slide that Henrik showed that uh, investment is not necessarily uh, ending anytime soon. Uh, so it's, 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 it's a booming business actually. Um, so the question then is how are we going to implement all this? And so it's time to get a little bit more um, technical. And in, in Monocle, that means Work Package 5 takes over. Um, so, um, Katrin, if you could, um, could start, and I, I know there will be a, uh, an interactive display between Oli and Katrin on these <laughs> slides. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Um, my name is Katrin Kosa. I'm from Water Insight in the Netherlands. We're an SME delivering um, earth observation based water quality services as well as our own line of um, in situ spectrometers for water monitoring, both handheld and um, fixed position instruments. And in Monocle, we are responsible for Work Package 5, which is on um, system interoperability and data integration. So, um, yeah. That brings us to the question, what does Monocle actually do to make monitoring more sustainable? And um, we fully embrace the Horizon 2020 paradigm of making data fair, which means um, making data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And of course, this fair, um, these fair principles have quite a lot of aspects to them. So there is a data policy aspect here, really allowing data access. There is a documentation and metadata access uh, aspect to it. But of course, there's also a technical aspect to this that is making it easy to access the data, to find the data, to technically access them and to work with them. And um, that is because it, data is expensive to collect. And we've heard that in situ data is really what is lacking in many aspects and in many places. And there is a lot more that we would want and we cannot collect all the data that we would want. So one of the aspects is to really try to make the widest possible benefit of the data that has already been collected so that it can be used for a wide range of applications, both now and in the future. 
And there is already quite a wide array of technologies available. Um, there are standards, there are software packages that are open, that are ready to be implemented. And yet, um, still a lot of data uh, sets do exist in isolation and do not link to each other, do not um, speak to each other. So why is that and what can we do about it? And the first aspect there we would like to um, share is that to make data sharing um, actually happen, it is important that it is attractive to both the data users but also to the data producers. And um, yeah, that is, it, there is quite an advantage as well for the data producers to use um, commonly agreed standards such as the sensor web enablement standards by the Open Geospatial Consortium. Because once these standards are implemented, the data um, producers can step back uh, from the technical work and uh, each sensor will just send their data automatically. They are stored in the database and immediately available. And also new sensors can easily be added. It's just um, the data, the sensor actually describes itself and can be immediately linked into a system without a lot of work. And also allowing users data access is made easier if all the users um, use the same interface. That means that the data producer only has to implement one interface to the data and also can save quite a lot on um, training and documentation for this interface because it's a standard. And for the users, of course, it's easy because they can use um, data from a lot of different um, data providers without having to learn new interfaces, implement new interfaces. And it makes it also easy to allow very different kind of queries. So it's not, oh, we want your data, but you can query data for their location, for date and time, but also for specific sensors, specific parameters, or data owners, or for example, data policies, give me all the data that are without any um, usable, without any restrictions. And that's the important takeaway point, that it's important to keep track of these sensor data through a whole system. Um, so it can be used, but it can also always be traced back to the producer and where it came from and how it came to where it is now. And with that, I'm handing over to Oli for the more technical parts of this. <laughs> okay, so we've heard the concept of how we'll make it better. This is now a look at some of these specific uh, flows and actions that will be made possible by these um, standard service interfaces. So the example we show here, um, we have a simple sensor up on the top left, um, which is part of a sensor platform. Because of the, they both understand the uh, standard interfaces, so they can actually communicate with each other. So sensor can talk to its platform and vice versa. Um, the sensor can send data to the platform, but it can also send metadata. So for instance, information about its current calibration um, and systems like that. The sensor platform uh, can then, using the same uh, standard interfaces, translate, transmit that data and metadata back to the uh, Monocle backend, uh, which is a, a storage area maybe. Um, and this will be able to then store all of the information about a sensor, the data that is associated with it, the calibrations for that specific sensor, and the protocols that that sensor is applying to generate the values. By carrying all of that information, we make the data more useful um, and accessible for multiple purposes. Um, so, as was mentioned by Catherine, um, Catherine, we also have an ability using the sensor observation service to request data using um, sensor type, location, time. Uh, you can use full bounding boxes. Um, so that's a great use for a user. Operators can also then manage the platform um, by testing calibration details and information such as that. However, you can then go a little bit more clever or a little bit cleverer. <laughs> Um, so, for instance, if a user wanted uh, access to data that had to have a minimum level of quality assurance um, for a particular time and space, uh, the system can uh, check within itself for the current calibration of the uh, value that's needed. And it's in this uh, slightly contrived example, the, this calibration is out of date. So the sensor that now needs to do a new recalibration is able to ask the Monocle system, do I have the sensor that I need to run to get a calibration value nearby and available. Monocle system can find one of these sensors. In this case, it's a temperature sensor. It can um, 
uh, task the sensor to take a reading and sending it back to the platform, which is then transmitted back to the original sensor, which can then uh, update its calibration. So as a, an automated system, you can sort of aim to start to improve the continuous flow of data without a need to um, manually go in, stop, recalibrate, change sensors. The system can take care of that itself, either automatically or triggered by a operational manager accessing the system. And then it could tell the operator when something's off. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Obviously. Saving time. Yeah. So those, those are two very specific examples. And this is now the overarching sort of architecture that we are envisaging for the monocle system. Um, as you can see around the, if we look in the sort of the center block, at the top we have our sensors. They are all talking to either directly to monocle backends or to data archives via these standard interfaces. Um, the reason for having a local data archive um, between the sensor and the back end is primarily for areas where there isn't continued uh, network access. So for a re uh, remotely deployed sensor that loses its network connection, it can continue to keep uh, producing data. And then when the network connection is restored, that data can then be transferred back to the main uh, monocle back end. So what does this sort of benefit give us? Uh, we can avoid data duplication and we can add the calibration tracing, which is a really important aspect. We can then use these same standard interfaces for um, exchanging data with large scale programs, such as GIOS, as was mentioned um, earlier by Mary Beth, um, and also to end user platforms, whether those are websites, apps, um, specific portals, uh, alert systems, the standard interfaces allow these systems to be built without specific knowledge of your system because they get built against the standard which your system is implementing so it will work with your system. We are then also have slightly uh, more complex uh, interactions with the system that we can do once we have this enabled. Um, one of the ones I'd, I'd like to mention is the server-side signal-to-noise ratio optimization you may want to actually change how a sensor is acting depending on the thing or the event that you are trying to monitor. Um, and having this system set up means that as a, a manager of these systems, you can go in and trigger these um, changes, or you can actually have automatic triggers such that given a certain set of criteria, the sensors will reconfigure themselves to give you the best data. And again, all of that would then be recorded and tracked as part of the calibration tracing. So all of these standards and services provide data to people. So if I skip to the next one, how do you share that data with people? Now we've heard from Henrik earlier um, that all Copernicus data is fully open. Uh, we've also heard that some of the in situ data that is used for validation within Copernicus isn't fully open. So we know that there are spreads of data out there. So this was a survey done as part of the, um, and one of the initial phases of the project. Um, asking people what are the most suitable licenses for sharing water quality measurements in an observation network. We can see here there is a great demand for free and open data, which we was kind of obvious. There is relatively limited support for pay for use license, um, but then moderate support again for limiting um, commercial use uh, license. So you have it free for certain aspects, but not for others. One of the, the other main aspect that was returned in this is the ability to acknowledge the data producer. So a license that forces the acknowledgement by, of the data producer is also a very good outcome. But I'd also like to point out the bottom row here, which highlights that there is still a lot of uncertainty even among people we questioned. And so the answer to this question isn't actually known by everyone and no one has an exact solution yet. So, to try and sort of think about these challenges and dangers of the open data, both challenges and dangers to the data producers who want to protect their IP or who want to get the correct acknowledgements, um, but also to protect the data from being used potentially not for necessarily good purposes. So um, you need to know the impact of your data. The positive impacts can be returned to you effectively with the um, uh, attributions. So your data collection efforts are then recognized, which ensures you get funding. Um, for producing the data, which is then used by someone else to produce another paper. But there are negative possible impacts, and those would be things like environmental monitoring data could be used to overexploit a natural resource. How do you protect against that? Um, with a fully open system, I would suggest it's impossible to protect against that. 
Uh, with a fully closed system, you reduce anyone using your data and it's just not an option. So that then leads us to a very leading question of <laughs> is a hybrid or partially open system required to maintain a system such as we are proposing in Monocle? Um, the hybrid system can be made up of a tiered approach, uh, time-based embargoes on data, uh, restrictions on whether you can have access to near real-time data or archive data. Um, there's also options for actually manipulating data, reducing its resolution for free access and having high resolution for paid access. Finding the balance between these systems is very difficult, which is why we have left these with question marks at the end. <laughs> which is why we have some time left. Which is why we have some time to invite a discussion, of course. Um, I, uh, I would like to encourage people who've been listening, uh, I know I've been uh, talking for an hour now, um, um, please use the Q&A um, uh, functionality in the application that you have running um, to phrase any questions, and then uh, we'll try and answer as many as possible. We also may get back to you later if we, we don't have a, a useful answer to discuss now. And um, uh, if you want to leave a general message, uh, you can also use the chat window for that. But we'll look at the Q and A for um, for uh, for questions and answers. So this this is a big big question. Um, I think uh, normally the data data owner, which is probably the data producer, should decide what their data can be used for. So we are we are assigning self, ourselves this task of making sure that our system respects that. Yes, but it doesn't prevent misuse potentially. No. That's that's just going to be very difficult. And in in Copernicus context, um, um, you know, the, the data are open in principle, but uh, registration is required to access them. Right? There's no control over how the data are used. So it's a different part of the. So we have an open data policy, yeah. completely open. Of course, we ask uh, users to register. That's that's it. That's it. So you know, as a minimum, which users are taking which data. Yeah. Yeah. And then Debbie, you've said, uh, did you did you mention it that um, uh, the data that are going into GemStat, uh, some of them may be shared again, and some of them may only be used for the purposes of the STG monitoring. Is that right? Um, well, there are two separate data streams. The GemStat database collects all the data from global monitoring networks around the world that are willing to share it. Um, even though they might share it with the GEMSAT database, they may not wish it to be made available to other people or only for scientific use, for example. So yeah. there are levels of, of um, access, data access, and, and that's up to the provider to decide. For the SDG monitoring, um, where that data is not at the moment available because the only thing that's required is the actual percentage value per country that's reported. Um, the data that's collected is is quite a high level anyway. It's it's not fine level data, sure. um, and it's just metadata really for to help us yeah. interpret the values. Um, yes, um, Emmanuel Boss uh, asked a very a very pertinent question. He says. Uh, um, air quality data, for example, in China has done wonders because the data are open, because there's no question about um, the, the numbers that have been uh, measured. Why do we think it could be a misuse? Do we have examples? Um, it's, it's, of course, a bit tricky to point the finger in one direction, but we've considered cases like this. Mm -hmm. Like this, for example, the. Um, uh, do, do you want to? I think we're talking about the same example, so if you want to take the fronts, for example. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah, so uh, one, one product that we produce at PML is for it's a satellite product that um, highlights where we have oceanic fronts. And if you're familiar with sort of weather fronts, they're basically they're, they're the line between areas of low and high something. Um, and you then often end up with collections of plankton and then collections of pelagic species, both large and small. You often get lots of protected sort of marine mammals and turtles will follow these areas as well. And so the, the data that gives you near real time locations for those could be misused by commercial fishing to highlight areas of known richness, but those known richness areas are also highly important for nurseries or for 
endangered species. So, so it can be a conservation versus exploitation, yes. example, for example, and um, you cannot control it. The question still remains, should anyone be con controlling this? Or, or should you take the responsibility of not releasing your data openly in the first place? Then? So what we need to do is support different data licenses. And I think what we're going to do next is try and come up with a set of uh, usage cases um, to choose from. If you choose to share your data through uh, a near real-time data sharing framework, in that sense we're aiming at something quite different from what currently exists, mm -hmm. um, then uh, you need to select one of the options so that it stays manageable and so you can expect to be acknowledged or you can expect your data to be visible um, um, to everyone or you can expect your data to be uh, known to everyone, meaning you can see that data have been gathered, but the values themselves have an embargo of a year, for example, or three days, whatever yeah, matters a, a, most. A time embargo is one of the most common. So ones. I think we're looking at all these options currently, um, because even if we cannot anticipate today how data may be, may be uh, misused, it's quite clear that the responsibility um, to choose a license lies with the creator, and also it's their, their prerogative to do this. So we need to offer the right um, choices. I see a lot of questions coming in. Uh, we'll probably have to be quite selective. Um, um, the Steve's question, I don't know. And well, I should repeat the question, probably. So yes. Stephen uh, Lozell said that there are potential avenues for issues, but are there published examples of open environmental data being used incorrectly? I don't know any examples either. But then again, we're not really collecting them in near real time currently. Um, one, one very simple case which we should definitely avoid is that when we, for example, include citizen science data here is that the position of somebody contributing uh, a measurement in the woods somewhere or in a, on, a, on a lake is immediately known to everyone. That seems like a bad idea if you could actually see where people are taking measurements with their smartphones. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to see that potentially being misused. So then uh, a little time interval. It, you could then choose a, a usage uh, scenario where you say automated um, uh, systems for satellite validation may use this data immediately. But yes. um, publications or um, un, un, uh, unregistered users may not, for example. Um, while we, sorry, um, yeah, I'll let you have the floor. But while we um, uh, take some more questions, I'll just put this uh, summary of uh, the, the main discussion points, the main conclusions up. Um, so that if you're looking, this, looking at this in the recording later, you can pause here and have a careful look back without having to find uh, earlier parts of the presentation. Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that um, inappropriate use of data does not have to be malicious. It can also be, for example, if somebody doesn't know how to interpret the quality um, indicators that are attached to data, that data is just used for purposes for which they are not good enough, hmm. instead of really maliciously using them for over exploitation. Yeah, I think Emmanuel made a, a point about that as well. That for example, citizen science is, uh, is one mm -hmm. of these examples where um, you don't necessarily want to just dump the data into a system and then people start using them. Um, but making them available as quickly as possible to processes such as validation is still uh, a useful aim because then the PI on the citizen science project can start looking at the data quickly. And as soon as they are vetted to uh, a higher quality level, then we can select them for other uses. In most cases for satellite validation, we're not looking at uh, uh, using the data within the hour, but a 24 hour window would be much better than some of the examples we're currently having. In, so for example, the Copernicus Marine Service, where data are being um, transmitted maybe hourly, but then it can take up to a month for the quality control to filter, for quality control filtered uh, data to come through. And then you're wondering, is that quick enough? Um, is, is there enough automation in place? Uh, or is it a matter of um, providing more efficient tools to manage that process in the first place? Mm -hmm. So then the data standards definitely feature. Um, Monocle is not going to build all the tools for that. But if we have a framework that is open, open source uh, and accessible, uh, that means that data mirroring becomes possible quite easily and that you can start to um, uh, host your own processes uh, against against such a framework. That is what we're advocating today, I think. Yeah. Um, when I talk, I don't read questions, and I'm lost again. Um, I think we've got, um, we got an earlier question from Orienka. Um, that's a very good question. 
puts us on a bit different uh, part of discussion. So it, it, it seems everyone is seeking funds to execute and implement a monitoring system. Is there a way out of this? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Henrik, do you want to take that? <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, I mean, if if you look at this from a a, a Copernicus perspective, I think the important thing is that we can always link a need for uh, for additional in situ data to an end user requirement. I mean, that's the way we work in Copernicus. So we we try to define a new product based on end user requirements. And then, I mean, we, we discuss how can we actually produce and validate these products? What kind of in situ data do we need? Uh, and as I said, I mean, the basic principle behind Copernicus is that we rely on what's available. In case, for example, that we see that in some, I mean, that we need access to these data uh, quicker uh, in a different format uh, or whatever. I mean, maybe then Kubernetes can support this. I mean, and try to 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 improve the um, the uh, the uh, availability of these data timeliness. Um, but but uh, but I mean, our focus is not on the in situ observing net networks as such. Our our focus is really on meeting end user requirements. And to do that, we need access to in situ data, but that's the, that's the idea. And of course, I, I mean, I, I don't know exactly what will happen in the next phase, uh, the next uh, multi-annual financial framework. As I said, member states are discussing the regulation right now, but I assume that the same basic principle will apply again. So Copernicus will not set up a, a, um, a, a Copernicus in situ observing network uh, of any kind. That's, that's what I would expect, I, but, I, but, I, but I don't know. So again, yeah. yes, Copernicus can support uh, in, in case, uh, in case uh, in added, added activity or um, we, we need some, some delta activity uh, concern uh, with, with respect to certain networks, but but um, but it's for us. It's really not about setting up observing networks. It's about supporting. You build on yeah, the national, yeah, yeah. the existing infrastructures. Yeah. You hope to help improve them. Yeah. The same is true for your Debbie. You, you get data reported to you. Um, and you're advising maybe about uh, ways to to gather them as well by offering the the Plus training. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and um, I suppose uh, AquaWatch works in much the same fashion, that it, it's not sponsoring new initiatives, just trying to get the community together to decide what the best way forward is. Um, I'll, I'll put um, the um, contact details um, up uh, here, so um, um, everybody has some time to write down some email addresses if they want to follow up. So. Uh, no, you'll find, you'll find out soon yeah. whether, whether whether you've been very popular on the, on the <laughs> internet. Um, Can I just say yes. the people who particularly are interested in the data aspect of Gems Water should contact Philip and not me. Um, Philip Silo, who's the head of the Gems Water Data Center in Koblenz. That will satisfy one or two of the questions we haven't yet yeah. picked up. Um, I would also like to underline again that um, uh, these webinars, um, while we try and uh, show different views from different projects, from different existing initiatives, um, monocles at the start, uh, as are some other similar uh, projects, at the start of its lifetime, we are half a year in, we're trying to determine what is the best way to start setting these systems up so that they will be sustainable. Um, so uh, if you go to our website, you can read a little bit more about our, um, our aims and objectives, and uh, we'll try and publish as much information and software as well oh, yeah. um, uh, there um, for people to use while we are active on it, and hopefully that creates further uh, opportunities. Uh, also elsewhere and outside Europe. Um, and that will include also some capacity building materials um, um, when these get defined. Um, so with that, I think uh, I, th I think we've taken enough time to be honest. Uh, so I'll uh, I'll put up our final uh, uh, thank you slide. Uh, just answer the last question. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I think I've, I've said so. We do not currently have a monocle system. We have elements that we are developing, cool. and we have three and a half years to get there. So yeah. Sorry. And um, um, so you see here uh, the, the logos of our uh, project partners as well as our, our, our guests today. Um, further information to the website, follow us on Twitter um, or contact us by email. Um, we're very happy to get your questions and recommendations. Um, appreciating the funding from the European Union Horizon 2020 fund there. 
And um, again, if you want to uh, look back on this and other webinars, um, there's the address. Um, we, may, we may do another one. We currently have nothing planned, but as we start to gather some results and we have uh, information to share, uh, we may reach out again. Many of you have registered for uh, updates and webinars. So if maybe a year from now, uh, you can another email um, and we hope to see you again. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank our contributors very much for traveling down to Plymouth um, for, um, uh, for organizing the technology behind the webinar as well. And uh, I think we wish you all a very pleasant start, middle, or end of your day, depending on where you're diving in. <laughs> I hope to see you again. Thanks very much. Bye.